Hello, hello. This is Vogue Stories, audiobooks by Kathy Collis. We return today to The Wedding Crasher, Episode 2. Sam is back in her office preparing to alert her staff about the newest victim. There's concern amongst the deputies, not just about the possible return of a serial killer, but also about the fact that they may have to take a back seat to the FBI. Sam's feelings on that subject are mixed. Following a restless night punctuated by recurring nightmares, she returns to the office to work with her right-hand assistant, Abdi, as they learn more about Bitsy Newsom, the latest victim of their elusive killer. Two hours later, Sam sat cross-legged on the floor of her locked office, hands at heart center, trying to slow her breathing and corral her racing thoughts. She wanted five minutes to steady herself before she went out to face the staff and let them know that the serial killer known as the Wedding Crasher might have made a reappearance in their sleepy burg. What was she doing anyway? She never intended to be sheriff. Her plan had been to scale back. Her decision to leave MNPD for a rural department took many of her colleagues by surprise. Avdi Issen, her captain, and of course, Larry Zelensky, her partner. I don't know why you want to leave now, when everything's going your way, he told her. Your close rate is through the roof. You're one of the youngest detectives we have. The squad respects you. The captain adores you. You're a hero, and I ought to know, since you were the one who saved my ass during the warehouse shooting. Why would you want to move to bird shit? Birdstown, Larry. Pickett County, actually. I'm going to be their first ever investigative detective. Whatever. Why move to the sticks when you've got it all going on here? Concern swept across his weathered face. Maybe you just need time off. Hell, between the shootout and Jay's death, not to mention your deployment. It's a lot to deal with for... For a woman, she retorted. She'd felt the misogyny, along with racism and homophobia, that percolated beneath the surface of the proudly reimagined police department. The new Nashville, with its international music scene and its rising reputation as a hot destination, continued to trip over its southern roots from time to time. For anyone, Larry retorted. Sorry. All I'm trying to tell you, Tate, is you can fix whatever ails you without throwing away your career. Maybe you're suffering from PTSD. What does Doc Summers have to say? Zelensky. She invested the word with warning. I know, I'm out of bounds. I just don't want to lose my partner. She tried to match his conciliatory tone. Look, it's not any one thing. More like three things. I just need a change of pace. Something less, I don't know, high pressure. Someplace where my nightmares won't find me. She could have added, but didn't. Sam liked Larry, and she trusted him with her life. Just not with her secrets. Now, a little more than two years later, she found herself in charge of policing the sparsely populated county she'd fled to for solace. Hard enough to be a woman, a newcomer, and an outsider who rented a room from a gossipy widow and kept all her business in Nashville. Worse, she'd apparently been followed by a serial killer enamored of all things bridal. The irony was not lost on her. Bitsy Newsom's body was on its way to a morgue in Nashville, with Holloway close behind. Abdi had reached out to Eddie Gould, a homicide detective from the Madison Precinct, who was on his way to Newsom's condo. Warrants had already been requested for her phone records, her car's GPS, and her social media accounts. Nate and a forensic technician were on site. Sam had made a series of phone calls on the way back to the office to assure the higher-ups from the mayor to the county executive to the district attorney general that, yes, she was on top of developments and, no, she didn't intend to leave anyone out of the loop. She still had to call FBI Special Agent Terry Sloan. He of the broad shoulders, crinkly smile, and amber eyes like gemstones. Jesus, Tate, give it a rest. She clamped her hand over her mouth, 
too late to avoid the discreet knock. Sheriff? At the sound of Abdi's voice, Sam popped up off the floor and turned the lock. Come in. I thought it might be Kaylee. She tends to hover by the door. I've noticed. You okay, boss? Not even close. I can't believe he's back after two years. Not necessarily, Sam replied. Unconvincing. Unconvinced. Sorry, Sheriff, but if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck. He noticed Sam rubbing her forehead. You need coffee? God, that's the last thing. As if on cue, Kaylee Simpson walked through the door carrying a fresh pot. As usual, she dressed more like a high school girl than a married 40-something mother of three sons. Multiple ear piercings lined one lobe. Bangles filled one arm, and a small tattoo graced the inside of her wrist. She wore a neon green crop top that barely reached the waistband of her fitted black jeans. That poor woman may not know she comes across like a streetwalker, bless her heart, Sam's landlady once commented. Cora Granville was nothing if not blunt. Sam decided to ignore the old woman. No one else, including the mayor and the county commissioners, ever once complained about what Mrs. Simpson wore in or out of the office. They paid her salary and Sam's. Besides, Kaylee was an engaging and efficient assistant who'd been with Sam since Tom Jackson's fatal heart attack had elevated Sam to sheriff. She made god-awful coffee, though. She also had a habit of walking into Sam's office unannounced. The sheriff had tried and failed to broach the subject, but Kaylee's injured pout effectively derailed the conversation. Sam suppressed a grimace, then pasted on a smile. Coffee. Perfect. I know y'all don't like my coffee, Sheriff, Kaylee pouted. Even though I went and mail-ordered those Arabica beans special for this office. We love your coffee, Kaylee, Abdi insisted. Maybe you could use a little more water is all. Kaylee put a fist to her waist in mock protest. Abdi Issen, you don't understand anything about proper brewing. Most days, Sam found their banter mildly amusing. Not today. Enough, you two. Kaylee, let me know when everyone is gathered out front. Then I want to start the meeting. The assistant grabbed the mug and flicked a triumphant look in Abdi's direction. She exited, hips swinging, long blonde waves bouncing. Sam heard the sound of running water, then the less than reassuring gurgle of the coffee maker. Abdi stood in front of her, waiting. What? Have you called the FBI? In a minute. As soon as he left, Sam took out her cell phone. Almost immediately, Kaylee reappeared at the door. We're ready. Let's do this. Sam read the concern on the faces of the people who reported to her. No one liked the idea of a homicide in the quiet community, much less one tied to a serial killer. Moreover, everyone knew a brunette in her 20s. I want to talk with you about the victim we found over at Cordell Hull today, she began. Preliminary evidence indicates a homicide. Woman dressed like a bride, right? Someone called out. The statement prompted a wave of incoherent babbling. One at a time, Sam ordered. Hands shot up like weeds. Ralph. Ralph Cook former quarterback at Pickett County High School, an all-around stand-up guy. Is it the wedding crasher, Sheriff? The crime scene suggests it could be. More mumbling. Could be, people. Maybe it's staged. We're working with MNPD and TBI. I've also asked FBI Special Agent Terry Sloan to come up. He'll be here late tomorrow. We turning this over to the Phoebes? Asked a veteran named Cornelius Cobb Atkins. Cobb had three years with the state police and 21 with Pickett County Sheriff's Office. In all that time, he had only worked one other homicide. He briefly considered a run for the top spot after Jackson's death, then changed his mind. Claimed he didn't need the pressure. We're not turning anything over to anyone, Cobb. It's our case. 
We simply can't do the work on our own. FBI involvement will be limited for now to Special Agent Sloan, with an assist from his local liaison, till we decide what we're dealing with. As you all know, he's been leading the investigation into these serial killings for several years. What's he got to show for it? asked Felix Booth, another old-timer. Sam plowed ahead. Look, we need their help, but they also need ours. Whatever kind of task force we assemble, this office will lead. Most of you will have some connection to this investigation. This case is a priority. We all want to catch the bastard who did it, don't we? Firm headshakes and set jaws told her she'd made her point. One more thing, people. I expect you to be smart about this situation. We're a tiny community, and a dead body is going to shake everyone up. Reassure your friends and family, but do not encourage speculation, and don't indulge in it yourself. Thank you. Okay, back to work. Her cell phone vibrated as she entered her office. Hey, Tate. Long time. Her stomach fluttered. Stop. I was about to call you, Terry, she said. Yeah? What's going on? She felt him shift to high alert. What's going on is I have a dead brown-haired woman in her mid-twenties, dressed like a bride, throat slit, fourth finger missing, lying in a state park in my goddamn county. Fill me in. She gave him the details she knew matched those he'd committed to memory. I expect you'll want to take the lead on this, Terry. We'll work it together, Sam. I know the background, you know the area. I know you've considered other possibilities. Imitator, admirer, misdirect. I'm not taking anything off the table. It's just your gut tells you it's the crasher. She didn't answer. Sam, how are you with all this? She felt her face tighten. Which part? The two dead brides since I arrived in Pickett County, or the whole wedding gone wrong thing? She took a breath. Damn, I'm sorry, Terry. That was unnecessarily bitchy. Yeah, well, given the circumstances, you're forgiven. I feel like he's following me. Are you having those dreams again? The conversation seemed odd. At once, distant and familiar as if they were in the same room instead of separated by geography and circumstance. Not really, she lied. Because if you are, you could see the doctor. She cut him off. When will you be up? End of day tomorrow. I can't get there any sooner. It's fine, Terry. Good news, in fact. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. Wild horses couldn't keep me away, Tate. Bye. She disconnected. Her hand strayed, not to her head, but to her heart. Her efforts to keep feelings locked up and memories shelved felt at risk. Yet in that moment, she didn't care. Sam saw the foot and silhouette at the bottom of her office door. Kaylee, damn it! What have I told you about lurking outside? She yanked at the doorknob. The door swung open onto a lush backdrop that could have been anywhere in the state. Not a park, though. The area appeared poorly tended. Vines wound themselves around old trees, primarily oaks. Tall grasses and thorny bushes created a formidable wall and blocked the sky. She saw nothing. No people, no animals, no birdsong. Even the insects had gone quiet. Day or night? She couldn't tell. Sam fought her way through the dense undergrowth, drawn by a patch of light. A break in the trees, perhaps a glade. The closer she drew to the spot, the more she began to notice signs of life. A bird screeched nearby. A rodent scurried underfoot. The landscape changed, more arid, less verdant. Green gave way to beige. Acoustic music played some kind of stringed instrument. Sing-song voices reached her, punctuated by laughter. She picked out words in Pashto. The soundtrack continued, but no one appeared. She came upon a small white tent, 
the interior tossed or perhaps abandoned. Strings of tiny white lights dangled haphazardly from the support beams. The sand, half-buried overturned baskets of food on brightly covered woven mats. Flies swarmed around a discarded goat carcass. A crimson mist lay across every surface. What happened? she wondered. Where were the occupants? At the far end, a slight figure in creamy white lay prone on an elevated platform. A woman dressed like a princess or a bride. She might have been sleeping or dead. Sam approached the makeshift stage and gingerly rested her hand on the body. Except there was no body. Sam clutched an empty dress, a piece of satin fabric. Ah, there's the intended. The words came out on a sigh, as if the wind were speaking. Not me, Sam said. I think there's been a mistake. No mistake, the voice replied affably. Sam felt a pinprick at the back of her neck. She sank to the ground. Someone lifted her to the platform. An apparition, dressed in a heavy veil, appeared above her. The left hand, minus a fourth finger, held a hunting knife. Congratulations, Sam Tate. No, Sam whispered. No, she repeated, louder this time. The hand with the blade hesitated. Damn it, no, Sam thundered. She bolted upright, clawing at the shadows. Her three-season quilt lay in a heap on the floor of her room. She noticed the ever-present chorus of night creatures that croaked and hummed outside her window. Katie dids, tree frogs, even a whippoorwill added a forlorn note. Nothing human moved. At least I didn't wake Cora with my hollering. She fumbled for her digital clock, which she turned away so she could sleep without watching the hours drag by. Four o'clock. Her sour stomach protested. When or what had she last eaten? In the faded moonlight, she could see a glass on the bureau nestled next to a half-empty bottle. Liquid dinner. Way to go, Tate. She kept a pad and pen on the nightstand. Should she write down her dream with this latest incubus, as she'd been instructed to do? Why bother? She rarely forgot them, not when they were simply variations on a theme. Screw this. She jumped out of bed, pulled on her running gear, and tiptoed out the door. Cora's tabby mewed once, a note between inquiry and irritation, then fell back to sleep. The road between Love Lady and Birdstown was predictably deserted. Sam leaned into the wall of humidity and drove from her mind all thoughts of ivory dresses, silver knives, or copper droplets of blood. She ran until her lungs burned, her hamstrings ached, and the compartments of her mind resealed themselves. After a quick shower, she headed into the office. Time to work. She plopped herself in front of her laptop and popped on a pair of glasses. Thirty-four and her eyes were going. What's next, she asked herself. The hearing? The lower back? The memory? Although, that might not be so bad. She clicked a file folder marked TWC, and five subfolders opened in front of her, one for each victim. Janet Barnes was a student at Florida State University in Tallahassee when she died. Twenty-two, a month away from graduating, and recently engaged. The date had been set for the following spring, fourteen months in the future, which would have allowed time for planning, if she'd had a future. Sam and Jay had discussed eloping. Rather, she had. I don't do weddings, she reminded him. It won't be a wedding, Sam. A couple of friends. A mutually agreed-upon dive bar. Preferably with a band and an easygoing justice of the peace. We'll call it a tie-the-knot party. What could go wrong? Sam closed her eyes against a wave of pain and opened them again. The second victim, Barbara Kopeck, co-owned a flower shop in Lake City, Florida. Natalie Garcia, the Georgia bride, had a position as a nurse's aide. Claire Hooper worked as a mortgage banker in Cookville. She'd had a stalker in her past, 
Unfortunately, he provided an unassailable alibi. At the time of the murder, he was in the hospital recovering from a beating by another woman's boyfriend. Bitsy Newsom, real estate broker and Nashville resident, was the fifth victim. Why here? Why now? Why did the wedding crasher miss a year? Was he indisposed? Working? Wandering? Had he settled down in her region? In her community? Abney found her at her desk two and a half hours later, staring at her screen. She lifted her head and sniffed the air like a hound on a scent. Land's Bakery, he announced, brandishing a rumpled bag and a pair of steaming paper cups. Fresh muffins and drinkable coffee, which, no offense, you look like you could use. Is it that obvious? I couldn't sleep either. Good news is that I got the go-ahead late yesterday to search Bitsy Newsom's social media accounts. Anything interesting? she asked. Abdi rolled his eyes. She was running a pictorial diary of her wedding plans on Instagram, which she shared on Facebook with an occasional aside on Twitter. She even put a couple of her videos on YouTube. Actually, it's part diary, part advice post about how to plan a Nashville wedding. Who to hire, who not to hire, that sort of thing. Really, sounds provocative. Bitchy, if you ask me. She knew who she wanted to use from the get-go. Cream of the crop, best of the best. She just went around to the other places so she could take selfies in front of the stores or tape encounters with florists or cake bakers she argued with, and then post reviews. Almost all of them negative, by the way. Reality TV stuff. Oh, yeah, hissy fits, name-calling, and phony as a $3 bill. Do you think someone paid her for her endorsements or her pans? Maybe. Or maybe she was setting herself up to be an internet star, although she was a little old for that. Those girls start when they're 12, and that's all they do. He caught Sam's smile. Come on, you know I have five sisters. Where were Bitsy and Mark getting married? Where else? Cheekwood. The people's choice. Abby used air quotes. If by that we mean Nashville's 1%. Cheekwood was a 55-acre botanical garden and art museum, just eight miles south and west of the city. Old Money and new climbers who wanted to get next to Old Money joined as members and became at least nominally involved in one or more committees open to generous donors. In return, they had access to the astounding array of facilities they could use to host fundraisers, charity events, and weddings. Membership at Cheekwood would make sense for an ambitious real estate broker and her undoubtedly ambitious lawyer fiancé. Anyway, Abdi continued, I went through everything, she posted a hell of a lot, and compiled the digital highlights. Get ready for Bradzilla, the Southern edition. He sent a video to Sam's computer from his phone and came around to her side of the desk. They watched as Bitsy verbally pummeled the owner of a flower shop, her stinging remarks dripping with honeyed condescension. She then addressed the viewers with, Well, my goodness, that's not going to work, is it? Maybe the owner needs to branch out, sell fruits and vegetables. He could knock down a wall, bring in a little straw, build the store as a farmer's market. As long as he stops using the word florist, wouldn't you agree, fellow brides? Bitsy winked and zoomed the camera away from her smiling face to the flower shop entrance. Well, ouch, Sam remarked. When did this go up? About six weeks ago. How many followers does she have? Couple thousand. Sam clicked her tongue. Well, that could put a damper on business. Let's see more. The second video featured Bitsy in a smart navy suit standing at a department store perfume counter, bemoaning the selection in front of her. Someone hovered just outside the shot. If I smell one more citrus-jasmine combination, Bitsy was saying, I will lose my mind. And trust me when I tell you, friends, do not pick anything that reminds you of lilies. You will smell like death, I promise you. Prophetic. Sam leaned in. That's a department store, upscale by the looks of it. 
Could that be Nordstrom over in Green Hills? Might be. Who's the other person? Can you zoom in? The grainy picture didn't tell them much. A light-skinned male of indeterminate age. Maybe he wanted his minute of fame, Abdi suggested. There followed a few mouth-watering shots of cheekwood, perfect for any size, absurdly expensive nuptials, and another video in which Bitsy, along with fiancé Mark, stood in a baker shop, making faces and expressing extreme disappointment with the quality of the sugary samples. The commentary was occasionally humorous, but more often cruel. Mark participated with good cheer and tacit approval of Bitsy's withering remarks. Groomzilla? Abdi asked. Oh, maybe he's playing the role of loyal partner. She doesn't like it, so neither does he. Sam paused the video and studied Talcott more closely. Thirty-something, moderately tall, quite fit in his polo shirt and blazer, light brown hair worn short, angled jaw, pleasant features except for the dark, flat eyes that somehow reminded her of a shark. Attorney as predator. He might even have a future in politics. What kind of law does Mr. Talcott practice? Mostly corporate although he spent a year as a prosecutor. A thought streaked like a comet across Sam's consciousness, then disappeared. Is Detective Gould planning to interview him? She asked. Not sure. He contacted Talcott yesterday after he spoke with the victim's parents. Dad Conrad lives with his second wife in Houston. Mom Alice is in Nashville. There's also a married sister in San Francisco. Talcott was apparently put out because he wasn't notified first. Got huffy when reminded he wasn't yet next of kin. Got even more irritated when Gould politely asked him where he'd been the weekend of his fiancée's murder. Did he have an answer? An answer? An alibi? Names? Telephone numbers? Receipts? Abdi replied. I should say he offered all those things. Gould told him it could wait until after the funeral, which they were going to schedule once everyone convened today. Mark Talcott sounds very prepared. Those are the ones who end up being least cooperative. You have a point, Abdi. Talk to Eddie. Ask him if he minds if we tag team on any discussion with Mark Talcott. Something's bugging me about the guy, but I can't put my finger on it. She sat back, hands behind her head. Our Miss Newsom seemed to have high standards and higher expectations. Maybe she stepped over the line with one of the vendors? Or the wedding crasher, Sam replied. They let that possibility sink in. Not sure you noticed the last picture, Sheriff. Abdi pointed to an image of Bitsy standing in front of a quaint-looking sign that read, Hattie's Vintage Wedding Shop. That's right down the road in Livingston. I know that shop. Doesn't seem your style. Abdi's voice was noncommittal. She cut her eyes to him. She'd never really talked with him about her visceral distaste for all things wedding-related. Abdi was good at reading people, though. It was part of what made him such a superior investigator. He'd picked up on it. Maybe he assumed her own thwarted nuptials were a factor. Maybe he knew more than he let on. Sheriff? Sorry, went off on a tangent. Sam looked at her screen. We tried to visit that shop during the Hooper investigation. The place was locked up. We never got to interview the owner. Might be worth a visit. Let me see if I can expedite the forensic report on the dress so we can confirm if it's vintage or not. Sam felt like someone had stepped on her chest. That's a good idea. Past is never where you think you left it, Abdi said. Excuse me? It's a line from Ship of Fools the book? This case brings that quote to mind. She knew the quote. She saw it as a rebuke to people like her, who thought they could control their own narratives. She tried to leave her own past safely boxed up and away from her present day life. Unfortunately, it refused to stay hidden. You've been listening to The Wedding Crasher by Nikki Stern. Next Monday, we'll get to know Special Agent Terry Sloan as he makes his way to Pickett County to help with the investigation. We'll also join Sam and Abdi as they meet the eccentric owner of a vintage dress store. 
where the killer might have purchased the victim's wedding gown. Tune in on Wednesday as we continue with Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Marilla meets Anne for the first time and is shocked and upset by the fact she isn't a boy. Anne is devastated that she is once again unwanted and that she might be going back to the orphanage. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave me a review and subscribe to my podcast. See you on Wednesday.